Good evening, everybody out there. Good evening, good evening, good evening. I'm going to give out Channel Zero a chance to uh, warm up. Yes, my uh, voice is still somewhat kaput. It's okay. We're going to make it through this broadcast. We're going to have it anyway. I, I can't stand uh, when the body attempts to slow you down. It must conform, and it will conform. Guys, I couldn't even talk yesterday. Nothing was coming out. How terrible is that for nothing to come out? So, I have typed a lot. Isn't that something? All right, guys, if you give me a moment, I'm going to get, uh, let me get this up to par here so I can actually see. Good CSCOT, folks. I see you there. And Mixler. You get you guys have been running the right way. Hopefully, there is no volume on my voice. I hope it is. See, oh, there we go. We got you guys covered. There you are. Very good. Very good. Okay. I've got everybody online here. Oh, one more stream coming in. We'll just waste some time tonight, guys. I wanted to tonight. I wanted to tie in uh, some of the uh, some of the aspects of the beast before we continue in the book of Revelation, because we are going to continue in the book. Revelation, and um, so that means we're going to be hopping to, uh-oh, what are the more controversial books? This is a very controversial book, uh, chapter 14 in the book of Revelation, the finishing of 13 going into 15 is uh, one of the more controversial books, and I say that because everybody has their idea about what these elements are, of course, chapter 14 discusses the 144,000, right? Chapter 14 does. And um, it ought to be a doozy. You really should. Ought to be a doozy. Right? All right. Well, thank you guys for your prayers. As you can see, I'm quite positive, always. Not, not simply. Seriously, I'm about, yesterday, right, my throat was hurting bad. Today was hurting bad, right? But, the, you know, we must continue. We do. Somebody asked me today, they said, why do you do that? Why do you do what? Why do you continue to press? You know, when you should rest. Why? Well, here, here's the deal. Sometimes, um, and I did rest yesterday. I had no choice. That is to say, I couldn't say anything. No phone calls. No talking to anybody. Right, nothing was coming out but air. I sounded like a flat tire, and so it's starting to come back now. So that's a good thing. But um, when your your body is always going to have its challenges, always right. It's always going to have things that go against it. But when you realize that you are a living, you're your living spirit, right? Your flesh is nothing more than a vessel. That's all it is, a vessel, right? You can actually begin to push beyond any resistance of the flesh. You can actually do that. You don't have to give in to it. And believe it or not, in the Bible it says, as man thinketh, so is he. Think about that for a minute. As you think, so you are. Do you know what happens when you perceive yourself in certain ways? Do you guys know what happens? Your body will conform to whatever your mindset is. You guys know that? Hmm? Your mindset's going to conform to that. Hmm? So when your mindset conforms to what you think, you, when your mindset is all jumbled up, your body is going to react or is going to obey or try to carry out what you're thinking. <clears throat> Isn't that something? So what you have to do is push beyond it. Healing comes this way for me in a lot of cases. Yesterday, yesterday, um, because it was so involved typing, I didn't really, I, I, I couldn't talk anyway, so I didn't. And I just kept pushing forward, you know. Plus, I was getting antsy, right? I was pacing. I was like, okay, I got to run my choppers. Lord, now you have to do something, right? And uh, so I just kept going. 
kept going. Even this morning, I had no voice, nothing, zip zero, nothing but air. About three hours ago, it began to come back. And that's something. Because I wrote the, um, the schedule, broadcast schedule, I just kept it there. Because I was determined to, uh, you know, pop on air. But I had no voice this morning, none whatsoever. Right? And I, every time you, you know, we hear something is wrong with your throat, obviously. Here's what happens. You get a, some sort of a virus that's trying to get into your system. Your body stops it. White blood cells start killing every cell right in the vicinity. That's where a sore throat comes from. And, um, but I just push beyond it. That's all. You keep going. That's what you do, right? You keep going, especially if you have other people in mind. And I'll, here's the mystery. Here's the secret right here. When you have other people in mind, right? When you do what you do for the sakes of others, I mean for real, right? Not, not for posturing, but for real. Your father will strengthen you to accomplish what you need to accomplish. He'll do that every single time. But the key is, is having other people to be your root motive, right? Now, we're not talking about uh, using people as an excuse for healing. We're not talking about that. We're talking about when you desire to do something for somebody else, right? Now, I'm not your favorite person. We're not talking about doing something for your favorite person. We're talking about doing something for somebody else when you desire to do something on the Lord for somebody else. Right? The Lord will strengthen you to get that done. He will. He will. He most certainly will. Plus, you're going to be determined to go forward to do that for a person regardless of your conditions. You will. And you're not going to complain about it. Already know the penalty of pushing through things, right? <clears throat> you do something for somebody else if you press through. A healing will come. God will strengthen you for that moment. Now, it does not mean your condition is totally going to be gone. That's not what it means. Because in a lot of cases, after you're done, your condition may come back and you're still going to undergo the process, right, of, of this natural process of healing. Sometimes that happens too. But when you do something for other folks and you're determined to do it, nothing has the power to slow you down. And your father is in your corner to get that done. Mm -hmm. So that's how, that's how you press through. You do that. And I have strong motivations for other people, probably because of all the trauma and loss of life I've seen over the course of years. I know people don't have the time they really think they do. It's been a, it's been many times, you know, talking to an individual and they die that same night, right? You had plans to go and uh, possibly set up a dinner, a meeting with some folks and have fun on the weekend or something like that, right? <clears throat> go do something special for someone. Go visit somebody's family and by nightfall, nobody's left. I know what that's like. I know what it's like to have friends in the daytime and those same friends are dead at night. I know what that's like. And so nobody really has the time they think they do or the time they would like to have. So whatever you're going to do, right, do it. Try not to reserve anything for another day, but realize something. God did not promise any of us tomorrow. He didn't. And all of you guys who have been on the front lines, whether you've been a police officer, Whatever you've been, when you've been on the front line where you lose people all the time, you know above all people that is true. And so there's always going to be a sense of urgency for those who have seen that, who know that, right? They don't let um, most people who have seen this, they don't let arguments or any of that stuff get in the way. Because I'll tell you something, there is no conversation worth a separation from a human to a human where you know that one of them is leaving. There's nothing worth, right, jeopardizing. A type relationship or anything else between those two, nothing is worth it. No argument, loss of finances, something weird that happens, nothing is worth 
separating one human from another. Nothing is worth it. And so when you're engaging in your day, remember that, that that person you're engaging with, that can be their last moment. At some point, you will have that happen in your life. It's not an if. That's an absolute. That's an absolute. Remember that. So do your good deed for someone today. Right? Don't put it off. Human beings should be your priority. They should. All right. Now let's begin. We're going to begin, shall we? We just finished chapter 13. Plus some other questions. Everybody is should be clear on the second beast. We're gonna I'm gonna reiterate something on the second beast here because we have three components. <clears throat> first beast, the dragon, second beast. The first beast, right, looks just like the dragon. The dragon gave the first beast its power, its seat, its great authority. So essentially, do you guys see what happened here with the first beast? And with the, with the first beast and the dragon, which is Satan. Satan had mankind erect a system in the world that is just like his satanic kingdom. The same way he runs and operates fallen angels and demonic entities. He essentially had mankind build that in the earth replicating what the dragon is. Did you hear that? So you have a visible, tangible dragon in the earth right now. Right now. There's a visible, tangible dragon in the earth right now. It is the collection of these kingdoms. Not one individual kingdom, but the collection of all these kingdoms. So no wonder, no wonder they don't want Christ to be at the center of these kingdoms. No wonder they work so hard, right, to keep Christianity away from different things, right? I'm not like most people. Most people, they believe in separation of church and state. I believe nobody should control the faith of another. So in that regard, yes, I'm in full agreement. What I do not agree with is that mankind totally ignore their creator. I don't agree with that at all. I don't agree with mankind teaching others to ignore their creator. I don't believe in that. I do not believe in the resistance to Christianity that is often met by all these kingdoms. I do not agree with that. I don't. The world is in its condition for a reason. When you move away from the doctrine of Christ, from the Creator's prescribed way of living, you walk right into a cursed place. Every area outside of Christ is cursed. Every area. And there is no prosperity. There's the illusion of prosperity. Like a person gets, you know, they're a multi-millionaire. Then all of a sudden, three months later, they're an alcoholic millionaire. And then six years later, they killed themselves being a millionaire. Hmm? Because that's the price you pay. Everybody should know by now that to, to really prosper in the world, it comes with a great price. You're giving up something. Everybody should know by now that in the world, to make advancements, right, is to compromise your faith. Everybody should know that. To be in favor with the world is to fall out of favor with the Lord in most cases. Everybody should know that. Bless the Lord, position a person in this world should they try to come up in this world. They're going to be best friends with sin doing so. We already know that. We know. We know that. And there's no way around it. There are many who have tried to bridge that gap. They want the riches. And they want to be righteous too. How can that even go together? If a person wants to be rich, 
and they have no security nor trust enough in the Holy Spirit for their provision. That means they want to do it themselves so they don't have to worry about having faith in provisions they cannot see. Because when you have faith in Christ, you don't worry about provision. He's simply living in this day. So we know that the world is, is, is just like Satan wanted it to be. And it looks just like the dragon, save for a couple of crowds. It looks just like the dragon. If you look at the description between the beast, the first beast, and the dragon, you're going to see a resemblance. You're going to see something that looks, I mean, they look just alike. Both have seven heads. Both have ten horns. The dragon has seven crowns. The first beast has ten crowns. That's the only difference. The number of crowns is the only difference. Uh, it's the only difference. So Satan had mankind erect a physical dragon in this world, a set of kingdoms in the world that mimics the dragon. And then he did something else. It says in Revelation 13, after all of this, right, that Satan gave this beast his power, his seat, and his great authority, Revelation 13, 2. He gave the beast his power, his seat, great authority. So he had mankind build what he is, is, is an identical kingdom to, to a satanic kingdom in the spiritual realm has been built in the physical realm. And then Satan, having gotten hold of the people who run it, has given it his power, seeing great authority. You may have missed this. If Satan gives something his power, it's not like giving somebody a battery. Satan comes to kill, steal, and destroy. So then the power given to these kingdoms is based off killing, stealing, and destroying. Now, how were these kingdoms raised up in the first place? Through theft, through death, through the blood of innocence, through the bitterness of war. That's how they came up. It's impossible. Listen, it has been impossible for anybody to erect a kingdom in peace. It's always been on the backs of innocence with the blood of many. It has robbed more people of a future than any other thing. Do you know that? He comes to kill, steal, stealing. Oh, boy. Kingdoms do that against one another and destroy destruction has been the calling card of all these kingdoms, all of them. So then we can see the attributes of the dragon are very well and, and notable in these kingdoms. We can see that, right? Satan is a liar from the beginning. Which one of these kingdoms is truthful? There's a spirit in, this, in these kingdoms. Can't you see that? For hundreds, hundreds of years, None of these kingdoms were able to break free of the killing, of the stealing, of the destruction. None of them have been able to break free of it. None. And all of them have been unable to incorporate Christ in them. Have you noticed that? Not one of these kingdoms has ever achieved celebrating Christ Jesus, not one of these kingdoms, not one. Do you find that odd? So Satan gave these, these, these kingdoms his parsing great authority, listen, which is essentially the first beast, a bunch of kingdoms in the earth with kings or presidents Right? Dictators, all these people appointed over them, but they are centrally the kingdoms in the earth. Now, in the book of Daniel, we examined this. And we looked at the four kingdoms. We looked at them. We know that according to the book of Daniel, this last kingdom, right, with the iron mixed with miry clay, 
is the one that spawned Christ. Christ came up in this kingdom. And this is the last kingdom before the everlasting kingdom comes in before the saints possess the kingdoms of the earth. And I got news for you, just in case you didn't know, do you not know that you'll possess the kingdoms of this earth? Do you not know that? All the kingdoms of this earth, you will possess them. They will be given into your hand. Those of you who believe in Christ, do you hear me? You know how, listen to me, because a lot of people, right, they're trying to run away, they, they want to run away from all this mess. But when you inspect the word of God, the kingdoms of this world are going to be given into the hands of the saints. No wonder Satan is fighting so hard. So yes, they're filthy now. They're filthy because you're not in charge of it. You're filthy because the anointing that is on you has not been extended to them yet. But that day is coming. The power of the holy people, you, those who believe, will be, be extended far beyond any power on earth. And the kingdoms will be given to the saints. So all these problems that you see, all these issues that make you sick, all kingdoms seem to face. One day, one day, they will be given into your hand. And in that day, they will become the kingdoms of our Lord because we are one with Christ, right? They will become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ. Thus, they will be given to you. No wonder you had to know how the bottom of these kingdoms were. No wonder you had to feel the heaviness of these kingdoms so that you would never repeat what oppressed you. So you find that revealing, hmm? that God would expose you to everything that would be a heaviness to you so that you would never repeat that again so that truly in your heart of hearts, you would understand the price of pride, that you wouldn't be callous. You're learning all of this. All of this is being embedded in you. All of it. You are living examples unto the Most High. Now, just watching something from the outside, you're living the experience. You know what that makes you? That's why you're going to judge the angels. That's why. Because you're living the experience. Now, we're not talking about Raphael, Michael, and Gabriel, and all those. We're not talking about those. We're talking about the angels, the one-third that fell with Lucifer. Those who are doing things in these kingdoms, do you know why you're going to judge them? Hmm? Because what oppresses you is a direct consequence of their disobedience. Do you know that? All these things that are a weight upon you come from them. You're living in a world that they are running. You're right in the middle of a world they are running. Oh, but newsflash, and they have no power to take you out. Because if they could, you would not be here. If they could take you out, they would have done so already. Somebody said, are we supposed to forgive them what the fallen angels? No, because they were made eternal. And when you're made eternal, you're not living my faith, you know. And when you know and you turn your back, then you have really turned your back. Listen to me. All of you, you're living my faith. Listen to me carefully. In truth, when you partake of something you're not supposed to, here's the truth. This is the core truth of your activities. You ready for this? It's because you really did not know. Because if you knew the realness of God the Father, there's no way you would ever commit a sin. If you knew the price to be paid for iniquity, there's no way any of us would do any sin in this world. If we knew the pain of the Messiah, there's no way we would choose sin. If we actually knew it, we could not partake of any darkness. We would not ever do that. 
But here's the truth. We're walking by faith. We're believing the Word of God. And sometimes when you believe the Word of God, you honestly don't know what has not sunk into your head yet. That's why you have these moments of conviction. When God makes something real to you, and you say, oh, Lord, forgive me, forgive me, don't you? The same sin you did a few minutes ago, if the Lord makes it visible to you, the truth of it, that's when you fall to your knees and you say, Lord, forgive me. And you'll never go back and do that thing again. That's called repentance. So then the truth is, that's why in the Bible it says, that the apostles, they did things in ignorance. They were glad that they did things in ignorance, not really knowing. Well, guess what? You have not stood before God the Father. You don't know the awesome and raw power of the Most High, the presence of Him, because if any of us did, we should never engage with any darkness ever. We would have no sin in our lives, but we're living by faith so then we can be forgiven. Because the truth is, we really did not know. See, none of us knew. When we were out there doing things, we knew it was wrong, yes. But we didn't know that it was really wrong, wrong. We didn't know that. Right? We had no, we didn't have 100% confidence in everything mankind said. We knew things, but we did not know things. Right? That's just like you guys, you know me. Right? You know me. So if you were to ever talk about me or something like that, nah, no big deal. I can say that, no big deal. If you curse me out under your breath, like some of you have, right? No big deal. But if you meet me, if you spend time with me, if you're walking around with me on a daily basis, right? And then you do it, you just did that for real. See, when you do something after you have known a person, you did that thing for real. How many of you have said something about someone you really did not know? And then after a couple of years, when you really know them, you're like, oh, that guy's not like that at all. I had no idea that guy was like that. Right? Had no idea. That's what ignorance means. Ignorance is not knowing. Ignorance is when you really don't know. Because if, if we really did know, then how can we sit there and say, oh, Lord, forgive me. I didn't even know it was this heavy. I didn't know this was the true penalty. I didn't know this was causing so much. Alcoholics. I talk to a lot of alcoholics. And you know what they say every single time? They never knew how much it was hurting their own families. They did not know that. They didn't know. When they find out the pain it causes their families, for some reason, that's enough to get them to just, they start fighting that issue. When they don't know it's really, when they don't know it's affecting their family so much, they always say, I'm trying, this, that, and the other. But when they find out it's affecting their families, when they find out it's destroying their children, that's when they fall to their knees and they say no more. I'll make this change. It's almost like a true commitment comes forward, but why? I'd be, they, they, they didn't know that before. No, they didn't. They did. They couldn't see it. It does not click all the time. It doesn't make sense all the time. Well, sin is the same thing to us. Sin is the exact same thing. We do things in this world. And we really don't see everything about it. And then one day the Lord opens our minds. He allows us to see the truth of what we're doing. And when that day comes, that's when we fall to our knees. Don't we? When we see the truth of the whole thing, that's when we fall to. You know how many times I've done that? Let me tell you something. Without the Lord revealing the truth of sin to me, Every step of the way, he didn't do it all at once. He does it over time. And every time he reveals something, I fall to my knees. And I'm so thankful he'll open me up to see a truth 
See, because he knows when to do it. Here's a fact. We don't, we're not always in a season where we accept the truth. We're not. We're not. He knows exactly when to do it. He knows exactly when you're going to accept it, when you're going to see it for real. If he shows you too early, you're going to blow it off. There are certain problems I've had in life. And in those problems, God gave me my things. And one day, having gone through one of those issues, I said, I see it now. Lord, don't stop these trials. Please don't stop these trials. Because I'm not going to know anything if you stop these trials. If the Lord didn't send me through something, I would know a thing then I wouldn't be as dumb as I look. I wouldn't know anything. But every time I go through something, God opens up my eyes, and I can I actually get happy in the middle of my problem, in the middle of the issue. I start getting happy. When the Lord opens up your eyes, it may hurt in the middle of a problem, but you cannot help but to realize that your father loves you because he's allowing you to see something you never saw before. Only God can do that. See, when God opens your eyes, you know it's him. And in the middle of your problem, you know the one where you feel like the Lord is beating you with a tree, right? That problem, you realize something. You say, well, the Lord does love me because he opened my eyes to this sin. And I can truly see it. So you can't help but to smile in the middle of that storm. And then amazingly enough, right? If you act on it, there's no need for the rest of the trial. And it's gone. It's gone. See, trials only come back to work where they've been sent to work in the first place. Trials and tribulations are promised to us by our Father. He said, we would have them. He said, don't think it's strange when you go through fiery trials, right? Manifold temptation. Don't think that to be a strange thing. The Lord knows exactly what he's doing. He knows what it takes to raise us. See, when he does that, that's when, that's when Mike realized he didn't know what he thought he knew. The more the Lord shows me, the more or less I realize I knew in the first place. Do you know that? So I never say, oh, I'm getting smarter. No, you got to be kidding. I'm starting to realize just how much of a dummy I am. The more the Lord shows me, the more I realize how much I never knew in the first place. And I'm incredibly thankful. Now, that makes no sense to a person in the world, but I'm sure that some of you can relate to that. Now, that was the, the same thing spawned by the question, do we forgive the fallen angels? No, sir, we don't. You can't and you won't. You're going to see them for what they are, too. They were made to eternal. They actually do know and they actually said no. And if you understood the, the soul it takes to do that, right? You know, they get no forgiveness. That's why they can't be forgiven. Because they chose for real. That's why someone, he partakes of the Holy Ghost, right? If they blaspheme the Holy Spirit, they cannot be forgiven. They can't. Blaspheming the Holy Spirit can only be done by those who are partakers of the Holy Spirit and realize it. Because if you partake of the Holy Spirit in that way, you also partake of the throne of God. You also also partake of the truth of Christ. So what it, you're, and there are a lot of things you no longer do by faith. You then know, and if you ever turn your back on that, you did so for real. A person who blasphemes the Holy Spirit is one who has turned dark. They don't want forgiveness. In the book of Revelation, you see a lot of people who hate God, who blaspheme God and his tabernacle, and those that dwell in the heavens. Having once walked with him, they turned on him. 
I got a question for you. What could be so breathtaking, magnificent, awe-inspiring that would cause a person to hate the living God, to choose another power? What is truly coming? What's coming? Matter man would choose it over the living God and then hate God openly and follow through by attempting to fight the living God. What is truly coming? And are you ready for it to arrive? Because it's not going to be some theory. It's not going to be some producer's conjuring of an image. It's not going to be Project Blue Beam, Red Beam, Orange Beam, or any other beam. What could cause mankind to sever all connections to the living God, all of the necessity, and side with something else in the earth that they would worship the dragon and worship the beast and brag on the beast what in the world is truly coming? And don't tell me it's a human being. We've had lots of human beings come in this world and no one built up an army just with a human being against the living God. Kind is soon to face what no one has ever faced. Do you guys know that you live in a time that's like no other since the beginning of the world? It's not going to be a time like it afterward. Well, let me tell you something. There was a great flood in the earth. There were Nephilim and giants in the earth, and it's going to be worse than that, the Lord said. It's going to be worse than any time that's ever been since the earth was made. So that means the great flood, all the destructive activities that took place back then, all the manifestations of creatures and giant Nephilim and everything else, That'll be nothing in comparison to what you're about to behold. We forget about that scripture when Jesus said, there'll be no other time like it, nor will be after. Did we forget that one? Hey, so you cannot compare this to the times of Noah. Because it's going to be worse. You cannot compare it to anybody's imagination. It's going to be worse. And according to the word of God, we don't have the visual imagination to put together something so dark to match what we're about to see. So what you're about to face, no one has ever faced. The level of the storm you're about to go through, no one has ever gone through. Not even those who saw the earth destroyed by water. Not even those who lived during the time of the Exodus and beheld the change of the heavens and in the earth and saw horrible sights to the eye. None of those people saw anything close to what you're about to see. It is those things that caused mankind's arrogance against the living God. Benny will fall away. The hints, the soft steps they take right now, piece by piece, trickle by trickle, they're engaging humanity. All of you better get yourselves ready for the greatest act of seduction humanity has ever experienced. Hey, okay. I'll be back in a few minutes right here at COT. Then we're going to jump right into the end of Revelation 13, going into 14. Everybody, I'm back again. Well, let's continue. All right. Wait, I'm going to ask you guys something. I'm going to ask you guys something. I know my voice is scratchy. It's not going to make for a good recording. But would you guys want to hear? You want to hear a story? Before I tell you this story, so many people look 
for things in the earth. They want to know what's coming. They want to know so much. They want to know the hidden things, right? right? After all, there is a scripture that says men's hearts are going to fail them for fear, for looking after those things which are coming upon the earth. They want to know. And they are actively hunting for those who have not seen. But you may not know the story of those who have seen. So I'm going to tell you guys a story. There was a fella, and this gentleman designed something for the U.S. Army. And he submitted everything, and it was accepted. It was a real game changer for the U.S. Army. About a month later, he's in White Sands looking for implementation, and he does not see it. This is after everybody told him, you know, that's going to change everything. We should see implementation in about a month. And all those months after, he didn't see it. So he inquired what happened to the filing. That was important. That was a breakthrough. And indeed, it was a breakthrough. Recognized by universities. Washington, you name it, it was recognized, and it vanished. And so this young soldier was irritated and aggravated because he wanted that contribution to be for his country, and it would have changed a lot, but he didn't see it. He just vanished. So he starts hunting, and he contacts everybody he can contact Every time he contacted someone who knew about the filing, they told him, leave it alone. Let it go. Design something else that has nothing to do with that. But he couldn't let it go. His mind was wondering, are there spies? Is this corruption here? Is this the work of the U.S. Army? Or are there some folks in here that are trying to, you know, have the upper hand on the U.S. And he continues to pursue it. He gets others involved. Some high ranking. They start hunting. They start finding answers. They start following a trail. After two years, he, it finally comes down to the wire. And a hearing is called. And that hearing turns into a couple of hearings and it draws a lot of people out. And all these people are testifying. Now they're under oath. They can't lie. And this is permanent damage to careers that have been built over many years. Should they lie? But they're trying their best to cover it up. To wash it away. After pursuance for a few years... The filing cover surfaces. The item was built, utilized, found out where. So the U.S. Navy travels to an unnamed place. And this gentleman gets to see his design and is incorporated into a pretty robust system. University representatives are there all over the place. They've been testing it for a year, and they never knew it went that far. So they test it in the presence of this young fella and all the brass that's around and all the representatives, and something happens. It's almost as if everything turned dark for everybody. The ground rumbled. The next thing you know, they know they found themselves in a place that was horrible. A place that made no sense. And they saw things, some sleeping, some roaming, some awake. After seeing all these things, everybody was shaken. Everybody was disturbed. 
And it made sense why some of those university personnel looked so labored. Why there were no smiles when he first got there. After the experiment, and something had gone wrong, all of them were transported outside of that immediate area. And all of them were sick to their stomachs. All of them were disturbed at that point. Nobody, nobody could shake the feeling of what they saw. Nobody could shake the disturbance of what would awake. Nobody could remove what they saw with their eyes and what they heard with their ears. It was something no one should ever see or hear or experience. They're all being transported and they stop in this village. And they see children playing, people shopping, eating. And they look in their eyes and they see these people smiling and everybody who was involved in the observation of these tests, they were not smiling. But as they looked at the people smiling and the kids playing, a young fellow realized something too late. They didn't know they were the safe ones because they never saw it. They didn't hear it. They didn't find out what was sleeping, what was waiting to come up and to come out. They knew nothing about any of it. And they could actually live their lives. They could complain or not. They could play or not. But they were protected. All of those folks who were involved in the test, their futures were ruined. They could never be like those people again. They could never have a safe life again. That young fella. He regretted every moment. Every step he took, he regretted it. But it was too late. Because he saw what many were trying to keep him from seeing. After all that, they ended up telling him, we told you to leave it alone. We told you not to pursue it. Not because we were hiding it. Because we wanted you to have a life. Now you know what it's like not to have a life. Can you imagine what the Father is shielding you from with all these mysteries in the earth and man is so eager to find what he never saw before? His pursuit and his motivation of that pursuit is so strong. They devoted everything to pursue it not knowing what they'll find. And if they find it, it's not going to enhance their lives. It's not going to change a thing. What it will do is rob someone of their future. We have a creator, an honest, upright, just creator that will allow or disallow. And for some reason, he has partitioned us away from things for time. He's a loving father, a loving creator. And that partition itself is love. One day, that partition will come down. And the Bible tells us at that time, many will desire to die and won't be able to. That to find another human being is going to be rare. And life will become a terror within itself. God has set us up to live, to go through things, to recover, and do it all again. And he has protected us from what he knows the majority of us can never handle. For that we should be thankful. One day, and has protected us for so long, the power and the authority that has held back 
a true veil of darkness for so long. He be removed out of the way. And then mankind will understand what iniquity truly is. And that day is coming. For someone, let this story be a caution to reinforce the idea that God knows exactly what he's doing for all of us. At the moment, we can handle something. Need not hide it from us. But there are things in this world that would ruin your life. Careful of your pursuits and be sober. Trust in the Lord's timing. Keep living with what the Lord provides, but be careful of what you pursue. In Revelation, we see a revealing take place, a revealing that changes everything. A time, time that undoes the normalities of life is very close to a time of an uncovering that is not comparable to any other time. Our Father's timing is perfect. It's also good. Life, yes, can be hard, but only because we're not exposed to the harder things. Rather, as we read on, be wise in what you've been provided. Because when the uncovering comes, and when it takes place, no going back. No one can go back to innocence. Again, the moment you're able to handle something, there's no need for the Lord to withhold it from you. That goes with knowledge also. A father does things in proportion with truth. His motive is love. Remember that. It also means, can a person live seeing what nobody should ever see? Yes, but you're not going to live in innocence like you did before. Okay, let's go. So we got to the first beast. The second beast, do you not know that he's the one that begins to unveil quite a few things? The first beast are kingdoms, just kingdoms. Right, Even the descriptions of this first beast, being much like the dragon, are things that kingdoms do. But the second beast is different. The second beast has two horns like a lamb. He speaks as a dragon. What is speaking like a dragon, you ask? Well, if the dragon gave the first beast, in which are the kingdoms of this earth, his power seen great authority, then the first beast speaks like a dragon. Political speech, legal speech, jargon, things of that nature. Setting up parameters of life, having people live within them, promising goodness and never being able to deliver. Having the same old things happen year after year, yet keeping people's hope alive through promises, having craft by way of television and the great many activities that take place where nobody can notice they are in fact craft. And they have already prospered. They actually work to tame the emotions of humanity so that your world does not go empty, especially if your loyalties are not quite with the Father. But the second beast has two horns like a lamb, and he spakes a dragon. And he exercises all the power of the first beast before him. And he causes the earth and them that dwell therein to worship the first beast. Another word, cause. He didn't force them to, he causes them to. Now, what could that be? Here it is, you ready? I can force everybody into a tent to keep them from getting hit by hail. But I would rather cause everybody to go into the tent. How would I do that? By taking away all the other shelters. I can cause you to go into one tent 
by taking away all the other shelters. And when you find out there's no place of protection other than the one tent, that's where you'll go. That's causing somebody to do something. Essentially, setting up parameters that people can only choose a few things. Now, this guy causes the earth and them that dwell therein to worship the first beast. Setting up parameters to glorify the ideology and the idea of the first beast that people would willingly worship like they do now. Do you not know that people worship the dragon right now of their own fruition? Nobody's forcing them to, but they do worship it. They hold it up and they give praise every at least once a week. Do you know that some of those people believe in Christ? But they give praise to it once a week. How do you give praise to something? Jesus told us that. See, when you lift up the fruit of something and you behold it and you eat it, right, then essentially you have upheld, appreciated where the fruit came from. Whatever it came from, you also hold up by holding up the fruit of it. The fruit of something is just the end result, the yield of it. So if you hold up the fruit, you're also holding up the tree. To reject the fruit is also to reject the tree. To accept the fruit is to accept the tree. In this case, to accept the yield of darkness, of the dragon, of the beast. What, what it produces, if you accept that, you in fact have accepted the source of it. So every time we celebrate a bunch of man-made things, not knowing what the true root is, well, that's what you're doing. Can you be forgiven of that? Here's the deal. This is so funny. Many of you have a problem with it. And you don't even know why. I know why, because it's in the Word of God. I know why you have a problem with certain things the world does. And it's not because everybody had a conversation about it. There are certain things many of you have an issue with before the Internet ever took place. You had a problem with it. You had an issue with it. You remember that? You had an issue. And you never knew why. You just did not like it. There are certain practices you had an issue with. You did not like it. It's because your name is written in the book of life. See, the word says, those who are written in the book of life, right, they won't take the mark, but they're also not going to worship the beast, nor will they worship the dragon. Worship is voluntary observance. Worship is just like a concert. Listen to me carefully. When a kid goes to a concert, and they give their strength of acceptance over to somebody else to hold them up. That is worship. That is, that is, that is simple worship, but it's worship. It is. See, having an appreciation for something, that's one thing. That's one thing, right? One thing, one thing. When you appreciate something, you can clap your hands and say, well done. That's one thing. But when you sit there, and you have a desire to be what you're seeing. Okay, you just drifted right into worship. Because covetousness, that, that same coveting feeling, is craft at work. Which is the end, but where one of the ultimate goals is to have you desire to be just like what you see. People do that. Let me ask you guys something. If I held up a ruler... Would you be willing to lay your life down for that ruler? I would not. Right? But if that ruler represents something, I can cause you to worship that ruler. All I have to do is give it a backstory. When I give this ruler a backstory and make it precious in your heart and in your minds, then you're willing to have this ruler stand no matter what. And if I do it enough, you'll shed blood for it. At that point, it is worship. It is, that's not giving thanks or anything else. That's not some clear motive. 
That involves you giving yourself to it. That is worship. People do that all the time in this world. These kingdoms are based on it. They stay powered by it. And this is an everyday thing. But many of you have had a problem with it. You may have caught yourself in the same cycle, but you knew something wasn't right with it. And because everybody else did it, you did it too, but then you would be standoffish asking yourself, is this the right thing to do or not? What does God value? above everything. What is the most precious thing to our Father on this earth? What is it? What is it? Anybody, what is it? The most precious thing on this earth to our Father is what? Humanity. Humanity is what God created. So keep that in mind. What has the world caused you to hate above all else. Buddy, somebody say, above all else, the world has taught you to hate something above everything else. You ready? Somebody said it's humanity. That's right. Humanity. Humanity. How did that happen? How could the world and those things in the world teach us to hate the very thing God gave us only begotten son for because this world is dark and it fights against the father like that every step of the way and you know what many people have done listen if you value something over a human being then at that point the bible already describes a person who keeps a heart like that lots of people do that they'll accept many things over a human being I remember one time this guy sat on the door of my car when I was a younger guy and I had just waxed the car and it gave me a real moment to pause. I mean, my, my, I'm, I was getting it ready to be offended because he just messed up my perfection on that hour, right? When you shine a car and it's just right and somebody comes up and I'm and not, not an old beat up car either. A new one, you know, where a newer car, and they just lean on it. And they happen to have a wide load with a bunch of stuff hanging out their back pocket. In that case, I felt tried in that moment. I did. I said, hey, what is this? What is this? You know, and I thought about it. I said, I can't do that. Not going to do it. I argued with myself. I said, I'm not going to do it. Not going to do it. Right. So I kept talking. The guy didn't move either. I eventually, I did tell him to move what I was not going to do. Was berate him over that collar. I wasn't going to do that. But that's what I would have done if the Lord did not bring into my mind the preciousness of humanity. I'm telling you right now that if not for the living God, I would have put that car over another human being. I would have. In places where there is an absence of the foundation of the word people, I put animals above the living God, things above the living God, everything above the living God. Why, how do I say Why do I say that? Because the Lord said, what you've done to the least of these, you've also done unto me. So when you put something above your fellow man, a human being, you've done the same thing unto your father. Whatever you do to your fellow man, you're doing unto Christ. That kind of hits you right between the eyes, doesn't it? Look at by way of your mind. I happen to draw a certain thing out of people when sometimes when they first meet me, they either absolutely 100% cannot stand me or they're drawn to me for reasons they cannot define. It's one or the other. It's never that in-between stuff, right? A person will either just, I mean, viscerally hate me, or they'll be drawn to me, and they don't quite understand why. Well, there are folks, when they first heard me, I could almost hear them. I can. Can you imagine when you meet somebody else and something starts speaking into your mind and tells you all the flaws of another person. 
And then you begin to develop negative feelings towards a person responding to the voice of accusation of fault finding, whatever the case is. You respond to it to justify a dislike of a person. Is that our father's way or something else? I'll tell you right now, there's something else. If, uh, that's why a lot of people have no real discernment. Do you know why? Do you guys know why? I'm going to tell you something, because you, you have to have discernment. Why would God allow you to see the whole of a person when all you're going to do is accuse the person over what you saw? If you could see the truth of a person and it would not disturb your love for that person, the Lord would allow you to see a great many things. Whatever you need to know from that person, the Lord would allow you to see. But if you will take what you learn and only use it as evidence against that person, your Father in Heaven is not going to reveal anything to you, which is why only in arguments do people see these things about other folks, something to accuse the other person by. All of us need discernment. But the Father will blind your discernment if all you're going to do is accuse. That's the work Lucifer did. Accusing the brethren day and night. Does that do his job for him, right? Let's continue with this. So this second beast, two horns like lambs, big as a dragon, he worships the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. He does a lot of great wonders so that he make fire come down from heaven inside of all men, right? And he deceives those who dwell on the earth by means of the miracles. He's, I don't know about you, but if somebody made fire come down from the heavens, I am not going to be impressed. I'm not. If somebody pointed a finger and a comet came out of the sky, I'm not going to be impressed. That's not going to impress me, right? So, but let me put something in your head. You live in a time where people have seen things. The Navy's not lying in their submarine pictures when they give you these posts of craft. They give you a eerie feeling. Those are real. I hate to tell you that. Those are real. Listen, when you see one of these pictures on the Internet, and it gives you an eerie feeling. It's probably real. Those are living craft. They do not follow the physics as we understand them. But they can traverse the physics. They can totally go through them. They do not apply to higher authorities than those properties called physics. But they're real. Why would they be real? Because when their flame didn't all die out, they went right to the oceans and underneath the ground. You can call me crazy. You can't. You have that right. But I will not be crazy nor hampered by things I see in this world. Nothing can do that. I think I've seen enough. But to a lot of you, you're prone. You're prone to it. You know of, of certain things. You've had experiences. But you have not seen it with your eyes. You have not touched it. You didn't feel the forces of it, nor interact with it. So it's not real to you yet. These things in the earth, right? These things in the earth are numerous. They are. And at some point, at some point, they're going to be used to reinforce Right? This beast character. Now, I told you guys, I wouldn't be impressed if somebody made fire come down from the heavens or a comet come out of the sky by twiddling their pinky finger. But if something on earth could command some very dark, dark vehicles and powers, it'd be a different story. That would be a very different story. Right? Because one day you're going to, people are going to look up. Hopefully it's not you. They will look up and the sky is going to look like oil. It's going to look like you're looking down at the ocean full of oil. That's how the skies will look. Who want to call anybody crazy in that day? But they'll be hiding for their lives. Because a great deceitful thing is coming upon the earth. 
great deceitful thing. Somebody said, what do you say when I see somebody say they want to, their goal is to kill? Well, let's entertain that for a second. In truth, if they killed you, what would happen? What would happen? I agree, by the way. They do want to kill you. But there's a type of killing they want to do. If they kill you outright, the Bible says to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. So then they lose, don't they? But what are they doing? They're doing nothing. They're just releasing us back to the Father. That doesn't do anything. So what do they want? There you go. They want to kill your spirit and hope. There it is. There it is. There you are. Because if you kill a person's hope, what do you end up doing? You discourage them and you cause them to self-destruct. See, nothing on earth has power to destroy any of you. Except you. You can choose a destructive path, but nothing can impose upon you destruction. Nothing can. can. There's so many, they stay that way. And they can't escape. They have no freedom. They have no future. Some have seen what they shouldn't have seen. And they were robbed of life itself. Christ thing to that nothing can. Now this thing, this same beast, right, had power to give life unto the image of the beast. That's very curious. Who I believe that is. I know a lot of people think that's common day technology. I believe it's a little more. I believe it's a little more. Now let me share something very real with you guys. And maybe, maybe, just maybe some of you have had the same experience, right? These craft that people see, it is cataloged of certain abilities they have, right? One of those abilities is to sustain a living thing, sustain it. And what I mean by that is, for example, if they were to spray a tree with a glitter type of substance, the tree wouldn't die even if you set it on fire. They've caught this thousands of times throughout history. I'm just talking about our time. We're also talking about back in the 500s, back in the uh, 300s, right? Those same times, the same phenomena of something was happening. They called it back then a type of glory. You know, it, in modern times, They've actually caught this happening numerous times. And when they drop this stuff on a tree, for example, it looks like a lit up Christmas tree for a little while. But then the next day, if you go and try to set that tree on fire, it won't burn. You can't hurt it. You could pick all the fruit off of it, right? You could just chop up the branches and everything else. And right before your eyes, that tree would be mended. So they have certain abilities, which they will no doubt break out in front of everybody. And when they do this, right, people are going to give themselves over to it. They will. They also have an ability to make a person feel whole and fulfilled and loved. You guys hear me? They have an ability to make you feel loved. They can elicit that response of love from you and make you feel love all over the place to the point, to the point where if it does not, right, if something odd doesn't happen in your life, you find yourself missing it. And he calls us all both great and rich, free and poor, uh, I mean, uh, rich and poor, free and bond to perceive a mic in the right hand and foreheads. Now, so he, he, he gives life unto the image of the beast. That, the be that this image of the beast should kill as many. That would not work. I want you guys to take note of something. Can AI do this? Yes, it can. It's doing it already, not killing people, of course. But it is trending each and each person on the earth has been assigned a node. 
as of 2024, each soul on the earth has been assigned an unknown to Ariel to listen to Ariel captures. They know who does not have an electronic device and who does. And they're going to get into the hands of those who don't have anything. They're going to get something in their hands. Everybody must have an electronic device. That means, that means a node is an AI representative linked totally to you. In the world of AI, that can be done. Things like co-pilot uh, better being used on the Internet, right? That can be done already in a very efficient way. Let me give you an example of something. The computer I have in front of me, right, has a 500 gigabyte hard drive. Just a 500 gigabyte, 100 gigabyte hard drive. And what is this story in this hard drive over and over again? That's its brain, its memory, so to speak, right? That the memory is organized much like the human brain in software. And so there are, there are literally hundreds of thousands, millions of algorithms running, replicated algorithms running. Right. Each time it recognizes something with a great amount of success, it will store its results. Kind of like um, it'll associate uh, the picture of an apple with certain proportions, uh, possibly with um, a question mark or with a smile or with a, uh, the temperature of the room or something like that. Right. It's actually doing this. Listen, on its own. It's actually doing this on its own. So. If a 500 gigabyte can store every fruit on the planet, plus, plus every name in the phone book, plus, 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 I believe it was a million pages of the internet it crawled, plus some other stuff. I mean, it's just storing all this stuff, utilizing it for comparison data, right? It, that's all it's doing is utilizing it. And it's coming out with some great efficiencies. But if it can do that for its memory, then indeed it has found a way to store things on a hard drive that nobody decided to do. So when it comes to this beast, this man, this thing, right, giving life unto the beast that would kill anybody that wouldn't worship it. What I'm telling you is this artificial intelligence, it knows if you're telling the truth or not, it knows what your true intent is. It already knows. Now, here's the arrogancy of mankind. You ready? Some of you guys know about a Fitbit inside of a computer, right? You don't know about random calling, it's called. It's a technique. In a computer, listen, in a computer, when it's pulling data and doing everything else, it has so many flaws and faults and incomplete um, uh, iterations of code that it comes up with this great big error number, right? This, this error number means it, it truly represents that a computer makes more mistakes than you can possibly imagine, right? More mistakes. But something, there's an unknown element within the processors. Every single processor, there's an unknown element that Steve Jobs was convinced was a link from a human being to technology. Bill Gates is convinced it is a link from human beings to technology. And when I'm talking about a link, I mean of the soul. These guys believe that in your soul are mechanisms that influence everything around you, and therefore it must be the person with the electronics causing the, this byte data to align itself based upon that individual. I don't believe that. Here's what I believe. What I'm telling, what I'm going to tell you, I want you to listen to. That means in electronics, especially when you're dealing with NAN and NOR or gates, all these different gates in combination of gates. When you're dealing with that. There's a fault tolerance that's pretty high. The fault tolerance is so high on a lot of occasions that nobody should have good data. So then what's correcting? 
what's correcting the flaws inside of a processor. It is, it, it's not working the way it's supposed to. They have this analyzed by MIT, by all your master universities, and it still didn't work out at the processor level. Intel still cannot grapple with the fact that in their designs, there's a float point to processing data that nobody has control over. And they suggest it must be spiritual. It must be up the soul. It must be something within a human being or an animal or plant or something that's predicating an outcome of that data. But what I'm telling you is that there's a piece in electronics that's controlled by spirits. How about that? Say, grab your attention. Think of it this way. You go in your house to fix dinner. Right? You have one pot. So in that one pot, you put three potatoes. An hour later, you're serving spaghetti, potatoes. You're serving rice and all these other things you had to boil. So you're doing the one thing, but you always pull off a bunch of other stuff that you have no idea where it came from. I have a belief behind that that I put to the test. Well, I'm in a high mode of looking into the Word of God, right? And I'm really getting excited about the Word. Computers start doing weird things, don't they? You guys, you guys ever find something in the Word of God that utilizes your computer, right? And you really need it to respond because you're getting, you know, all these all things are starting to fit together and all of a sudden, all of a sudden, your computer does not want to work with you anymore. Hmm. You ever get an idea about the Word of God? And you say, oh, wow, well, let me go write this down. And all of a sudden, you know, want, your computer's never done it. But now your computer does not want to start. Your phone wants to hang on an application. Something weird happens, right? Like it's opposing you. Like it's telling you you're not supposed to go down this road yet. Something in electronics. There's an element like that inside computers. Now, how easy would that be for someone to control? Here's the other fact. If you sat near a computer and never touched that computer, and they had a random generator on that computer, and they gave you the, the, the seeds on us to say they, they gave you the numbers, right? They wanted you to pick a number between what that computer has in it to see how many times the number you picked would come out. You're going to be astounded at the results every single time, which means you have an effect, a measurable effect on equipment around you with AI, with artificial intelligence. This beast could easily, easily, easily have a machine or have artificial intelligence put in just about anything. Right now, they have two mechanoids ready, two mechanoids ready right now. And they are incredibly amazing, incredibly amazing. They have, they have come so far in their technology right now through AI. Right? There are tons of different types of cancer that have been cured. Do you guys know that? Things that mankind was unable to do in the civilian realm, AI finally solved. The trials for cancer are underway. The trials for Alzheimer's reversal are on the way. They found the gene that causes people to age. The trials for that therapy is on the way. They found another way, right, to do what they, how they put it, is somewhat like to um, shock your genome, your, your genes into action, replacing any damaged or lost, uh, you know, parts of the body and things of that nature. They're actually trying this. They're actually doing this. They're doing it now. That, that stuff went in at the beginning of the year. Artificial intelligence is doing some incredible things, but you know and I know, you know and I know, anything used for good is going to be usurped 
for weapons. You already know this, right? You guys know this. So he kills the, this beast, this image of the beast. What would that be? What would the image of the beast be? A lot of people believe that it is the Islamic part of the Islamic world. That's what they believe. Here's the only problem with that. My problem with that is this, right? In the book of Daniel, it describes this beast. You know what it says? He worshipped a god his fathers knew not. A strange god will he increase with riches, right? And it also says God of force. God of force is relatively new. It is very new. It is not old. People's forefathers did not have it. They do. So that element, that this God of force is going to be increased, right? According to the book of Daniel, it's going to be put all over the place, right? Which means... You're going to have these habitation spots, kind of like these um, platforms that, that Microsoft and Google use on the oceans. Oh, guys, I almost lost my headset on that one. So having said that, having said that, folks, and we haven't even touched the unseen things, but just in the practical realm, to close out the beasts, they're going to read, they're going to set up this world in a way. Now, listen to me carefully. The world is primed right now, right now, to start, you know, absolutely changing democracy and what we think of democracy. Everything that we know of is going to be altered. And can you feel the winds of change right now? as it continues to change. We're going to find ourselves dealing with people who are worshiping something different. And Christianity is going to be the number one most unpopular subject in the world. You guys heard about that shooting in Texas, right? Joel Olstein. You guys heard about that? Joel Olstein. That shooting. That shooting. Now, how do you think that the average person interprets that? Okay. What do you think the, the a person of the world is saying about that? I'll tell you what they're saying. They're doing exactly what Scripture said they would do. What does Scripture say they would do? During the time where these things are happening, people would mock a skull. They would say, where's the promise of us coming? I thought you'd be gone by now. You're still here, right? Hopefully that won't discourage anybody, but that's what they'll do. That mockery, that, that type of mockery is exactly what people are doing. Do you know that? They're actually almost saying that verbatim. I thought you guys be out of here by now. Isn't that how they, how they say when the trouble comes? Wonder what people will say on Wednesday. Same thing. They probably will. We're primed. And these beast elements. Maybe it's one thing. Don't fear these guys. Because the Bible says if you're in the book of life, you will not take the mark of the beast. You will not worship the dragon, nor will you worship the beast. If you're in the book of life. That is the key to be in the book of life. Okay, folks, here's what we're going to do. We have an app in here. You guys, did you have that? You guys do have that, right? This, this, this God of force thing is spreading from the White House to Moscow. It's spreading. There's a cult that's growing among famous people. Call it a cult. It's the only way I see it. People are being drawn to it left and right. These mark the times of entry. And, and as people continue to adopt these strange things, continue. So that gives us a pretty good, pretty good watch or timing piece. 
that we're entering in. Right? We're really entering in really close. Things are being set up on the in the out of the frame of your eye. But for those of you who are with the Lord, hear me carefully. Live your life accordingly. Have an understanding that this beast element is coming. You don't live your life in fear. Live your life in liberty. In liberty. Live your life in liberty. That is not to fall prey to anybody's ideology that will speak against the word of the Lord in your life concerning the steps you take. And if this, and listen though, if the steps of a righteous man are ordered of the Lord, then as you agree to walk with Christ, nothing can stop you in the first place. You're going to be ready. You guys will see a lot of change this year. You will. And I do apologize for the voice thing. It is getting better even during this broadcast. Can you guys tell? Of course, I do probably have veins sticking out of my neck. But um, this uh, question might be Maria. I'm, well, I wouldn't call it that. I wouldn't. There's reportedly a lady who went there by herself. She went there. And when she came back, from that place, right? get a brand new set of teeth. Her cancer subsided. Her eyesight was good. That came from them, that place, right? That mountain. Walking right into it. On the opposite side, that a lot of people have been lost there. Some people have come back raving lunatics from there. In other words, it, there is no one definition you can put on that place. To some it has helped to others. It has robbed everything from them. For those it helped, it seemed like all they wanted was for them, it was for someone to speak in a good light about that place. Weird things. Satan does that a lot too. He'll give you perks for servitude to him, but in the end, he'll destroy you after he's definitely he's used you up, after he's done with you. But of all those things, remember, the Lord knows exactly what he's doing concerning your life. You're not here, so you can be a punching bag for anybody. You're here. Folks, we're going to cut this, we're going to cut this broadcast, right? I'm coming back. I get a feeling I'm going to be whole the next broadcast. So it may be a bit lengthy, broken down into two segments. The next broadcast will be. And I think I'm going to have a slot for questions so that anybody, if they, so I can really focus on some of your questions concerning the beast, all right, concerning Everything up until the point in Revelation where we've got to, because as we continue to read, right, in here, I was going to read 14 tonight, but I can't open that as a can of worms, because you start talking about uh, something that we're going to be reading out of three books and some letters and some other things concerning this very topic. And I want you guys to see it, but also to have a context for what Jesus spoke about over and over again, right? You don't, listen, folks, you, you don't have to be anything special. You know why? Because you were, if you were not special, you would not have been sent here to this earth during this time. Do you have that? You don't even need to be sealed. How do I know that? Because you believe in Christ, and that is your seal. Your belief in Christ is your seal. You don't need to escape. You don't need to escape anything because your Savior is the only one who has power to remove the seals from the scrolls. Isn't that awesome? Only the Savior can initiate these things in the earth. And it just happens to be your Savior. 
He's not doing what he's doing to destroy you. No, he's doing what he's doing to ultimately deliver you. Folks, God bless each of you. You guys take care of one another. When we come back tomorrow, we may talk about Wednesday. Let, we have a lot of dates, just go ahead and face it. You know, I told you guys I wrote the dates down. Tracking uh, some particulates and the dates are, there are too many dates. There, there are too many dates in the concentration, right? It's going to become unbelievable soon. My prayer is that in proportion to the times, we can continue to grow and strengthen ourselves spiritually. That nothing, nothing will have an ability to shake us that loose. Oops, God bless you. You guys take care of one another. I'm going to see you next time right here at the Council of Time. I think my voice should be a lot better, right? And um, God bless you guys. I'll see you next time right here at COT. As soon as I find the button, it, it, it vanished on me. There it is. I see it. Okay, everybody. God bless you. Channel Zero, you're going out now. Everybody else is still on. Except Channel Zero, I'm going to hit the stop button. Hopefully it doesn't mess up there. Recording things. I'm going to talk longer next time without the scruffiness in the voice. No one wants a long recording with a, you know, a voice like this. You guys remember that story, please. We'll see you guys next time right here at COT. God bless you. Thank you, Angela, for dropping in. Well, guys, I'm, I'm seriously lost the button. I mean, okay, here we are. Well, God bless you guys. I'm out. Now, this time's for real. I'm gone. God bless you guys. I'll see you next time or two tomorrow right here at COT.